Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. And I'm Noe Na'au. In our show this time, we'll cover the recent downtown forum entitled, Hawaii, the State of the Arts, Inspiration for Everyone at the Anthology Theater. The program featured a panel of speakers representing symphonic music, opera, ballet, theater, ceramics, fine arts, and digital media. The question of the day was, will the arts survive or thrive in Hawaii? The bottom line is that Hawaii is a place that has traditionally loved music, dance, and the arts in general. But that's changed. Some say we've lost ground. Where are we now, and where are we going? Is it the disparity? Is it the latchkey and homeless kids? Is it the disconnect with our past? Is it a world of social media and prime time that teaches us sports, weather, accidents, crime, and little else? Is it the aging infrastructure of our arts? Is it the burden on our schools? Is it a government with so many priorities other than the arts? Is it the emergence of generations that have not been involved in the arts and are unable to pass them on? Doesn't a great state deserve great art? Put the other way, a state with great art is a great state. And where does Hawaii fit in all of that? And there was an audience that wanted to know more about the arts in Hawaii, including Senator Brian Taniguchi, chair of the Senate Committee on Higher Education and the Arts. The panel members talked about their particular areas of the arts, their successes and challenges, state policy, and what we can do to build greater public involvement and support of the arts. As is our custom, we circulated a more detailed bio sheet to give our audience background on the members of the panel. Our first speaker was Jonathan Parrish of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. He spoke about symphonic music in Hawaii. Thank you, Jay, and uh, for hosting this forum, and thank you to uh, Hawaii Business Magazine for sponsoring this forum and encouraging discussion among our local arts organizations about how we can all contribute to the community better when we collaborate and support each other. I think it's important that we view the arts as an ecosystem of sorts, uh, where all things are related and there are many interdependent relationships. Uh, I believe that the success of one art form uh, or organization encourages the success of others. The importance of a professional orchestra uh, to producing uh, or, or to a community is, is um, uh, certainly um, uh, critical and uh, the, the, the orchestra forms the, the critical mass of musical talent that is needed for so many other things uh, to, to exist. The, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra carries on a century-old artistic legacy of the Honolulu Symphony, and we play an important part um, that's not always obvious in our arts ecosystem. We actively recruit and relocate a highly talented musical workforce that serves the community in many ways beyond our own concerts. More than 75% of our musicians have relocated to Hawaii because of the symphony. Uh, what's also notable and that we're something very proud of is that about 25% of our musicians uh, were raised and educated in Hawaii, including Fumiko, uh, studying with members of the symphony to attain the level required to earn a position in the uh, HSO. So as I said, our musicians form this critical mass of musical talent that benefits everything from uh, Chamber Music Hawaii to Ballet Hawaii's Nutcracker uh, to the Royal Hawaiian Band, the Hawaii Pops, uh, the Hawaii Youth Symphony, the instrumental faculty uh, at UH Manoa, of which more than half are symphony musicians. Then we had remarks from Simon Crookall of the Hawaii Opera Theater on opera in Hawaii. Uh, but Hawaii Opera Theater is thriving and well. Opera has been performed here in the islands for over 100 years, and there are tales of the royal family actually taking part in operas uh, in the former opera house, which now sadly doesn't exist. But the Hawaii Opera Theatre started as part of the symphony, uh, of, the, of the Honolulu Symphony in 1960, and then the two companies divided uh, in 1980. We bring together in opera a lot of different components. So we have music, we have theatre, we have visual art, and increasingly we have video too, we were just talking about that. But also in opera it takes a village to put on a production, so we have local people, including our chorus, which are entirely volunteer. We have the musicians uh, who uh, play with the uh, Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And we have volunteers backstage who do everything from makeup to hospitality uh, to security, all kinds of things. 
And then we also bring in international solos from across the country and across the world to take part in the productions. And by the way, the productions nowadays also come from all over the world. We brought one in from Finland last year. Uh, we bring uh, operas in from all over America. The, the recent Magic Flute came from Arizona. Despite the challenges of funding and participation, which are shared by all of us, I think, at this uh, table, uh, but also by opera companies all over the world, and that includes the fact that for opera, audiences are aging, uh, subscription audiences are declining on a national trend. People are much uh, shorter term in their commitments these days. But over the past two years, HOT has managed to put ticket sales up by 29%. Uh, we finally this year started to increase our subscription number for the first time since 2000. And online sales have gone rocketing up. Uh, we increased over 800% over the last two years. After that, we heard from Pamela Taylor Tong of Ballet Hawaii on Ballet in Hawaii. 40 years of continuous service in the community, teaching dance to countless youngsters, presenting top national, international companies on the stages of the Blaisdell and the Hawaii Theater, showcasing world's top soloists in full-length productions, and bringing dance to underserved schools and organizations. Mayor uh, Fossey is paid tribute by Valley Hawaii for his foresight and funding for the company and to all those that supported their time, talent, and money. We are supported by State Foundation for the Culture of the Arts and for all and MOCA, Mayor's Commission for Culture and the Arts. Our mission is to teach. Our school has between 400 and 500 students. We have classes seven days a week, and we have two locations. We have a full program, 12 week sessions, and we have a summer intensive that culminates in a production that we have collaborated with Washington Ballet, Cincinnati Ballet, and so dancers have the opportunity to perform with professionals. Ah, productions. We do our three productions. Nutcracker is our annual production, and it includes this year 160 dancers that are in the performance. Those are our students. We have 12 professional dancers from top companies, New York City Ballet, Miami City Ballet this year, San Francisco, Carolina Ballet, and Megan Fairchild once again comes to our stage after being on Broadway in On the Town. John Selye is coming back after being um, on tour with Twyla Tharp, so we have a number of family members, I feel like, because they've been with ballet for quite some time. Then we had remarks from Dina Dre of Diamond Head Theater on theater in Hawaii. So, Diamond Head Theater is 100 years old this year. I've been there 20 of those years. Sometimes it feels like 100, <laughs> but most days I truly love my job. And let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and why I love it. Diamond Head Theater is a community theater. What that means is we are for and by the community. That means we are cast, the sets are built all by volunteers. We have an occasional professional actor that comes in. We do have a professional orchestra, but the theater is by and large a volunteer community theater. We put on six shows a year to over 40,000 audience members who come in our doors, every age group from young kids to super seniors. We have a strong and vibrant volunteer program, over 600 volunteers, including the cast members. We have volunteers who take tickets, who work in our gardens, who paint our sets, who sew our costumes. It's very important for us to have a volunteer program that works for everybody. And we have an education program. Our education program is robust. We have over 100 different classes every year, over 1,000 students. And again, that ranges from the little baby ballets to the new senior jazz that John Rampage is teaching. And this is how popular this class is. John is an unbelievable teacher. You have to be 60 to be in the class, and people are lying about being 60. <laughs> Honestly. 
They are saying they're 60 when they're younger. So our education program is very robust. We have a summer program that sells out within 10 minutes online in the summer. All of this is wonderful. We are doing very, very well. Where our challenge is, is our space. We're in an old, decaying, dilapidated theater, and we're embarking upon the biggest effort in our history, and that is a capital campaign to build a new theater. After that, we heard from Stefan Yost of the Honolulu Museum of Art on the fine arts in Hawaii. But basically, we are multiple institutions together under one umbrella. The, you probably know the Academy, former Academy, Honolulu Museum of Art. On Baratania, we have the former Contemporary, which we call Spalding House, in Lenokona, which is the Honolulu Museum of Art School. Just to get a little kind of overview, we're full-time equivalent of 180 staff members. Um, two of them, which are full-time dedicated just to social media. Um, so we go in a lot of directions simultaneously. Fundamentally, we're about bringing great art and people together in art and really any media. We run the largest art film house, six nights a week we have film. And I agree with you, people are not gonna go to see film in theaters. But what we've done now is restructured our film program to be cultural events that happen to show film. So you might have the Skate Film Festival or the Surf Film Festival or the Bollywood. They're cultural events that show the medium of film. They're not film events, right? That's a huge shift in thinking. Um, fundamentally, it's about the collection. Um, we've got 65,000 works of art in our collection. We show 3% of what we own is on view. Um, the value of the collection, um, let me just put, uh, it's massive, it's the most expensive square block within 250, uh, 2,500 miles by far. Um, it would be impossible to form the collection today, regardless of how much money you have. They're just, these things are not available. Our job is to show and reflect the cultures that have made Hawaii their home and to show them really about unqualified excellence. It doesn't matter whether it's Filipino or European, it's about making sure that we learn about our neighbors based on the best that those cultures create. I, when I say this, I don't say this lightly, but I think civic societies are based upon institutions like all of ours here in intellectual and civic conversations. Then we had remarks from Yukio Ozaki of Chaminade University on ceramics and woodworking in Hawaii. Uh, I represent more or less uh, individual artists and uh, groups organized by those people. And um, I'm introduced as a uh, ceramics potter and then also a wood uh, artist. But um, I feel responsible for uh, somehow, with my pathetic uh, knowledge, uh, represent uh, other mediums also. Uh, one of the differences that I come from is used to be a uh, craft and uh, it's only in the past uh, 100 years that has been uh, accepted into fine arts uh, on the contrary uh, paintings has been you know through the ages and uh, gradually uh, printmaking joined that and then recently photography all of this came together and then people are, are far more sophisticated to know the value of those in different ways. And so it's very difficult to uh, explain or represent all of those. Uh, what I know is um, what's happening in Hawaii. Uh, I should know more, but I don't go out. Like my wife says, I'm one of the most unsociable person. <laughs> and so <laughs> I don't get around. And yet uh, uh, I know Everything is happening thanks to the uh, crossroads uh, in the world almost, and then certainly Pacific. And I have met some of the people that I would never have had the uh, honor to meet and talk with even. And so we are very lucky, and uh, certainly we should take advantage of that. On the other hand, artists here as individuals uh, have uh, naturally a very difficult time in um, producing and sending them out. Basically, we have to export. And then very often, we have to import the material. And so they are very difficult facts that uh, makes it hard. Finally, we heard from Gerard Elmore of the Academy for Creative Media on Film and Digital Media in Hawaii. 
we have a handful of independent filmmakers on the island. We also have ad agencies who, um, um, who create a lot of digital content. Um, and we also have ACM. Um, I, I actually, actually lecture at ACM. I'm not really a professor, but I come from the real world and sort of tell the students how it is. And sometimes they don't want to listen, but I tell them that's how it is. Um, so um, there, you know, there's limited uh, places that uh, digital media comes from right now, but uh, the opportunities are growing. And um, I, I'm one of the few people that actually make a living just being a, a full-time filmmaker. And um, what, does, what, what you need to do to make that happen in Hawaii is basically you need to work your butt off. Um, you know, you have to do multiple jobs. You have to be a sort of a Mac MacGyver, and that's the name of my business, which is what would MacGyver do? Um, and, and so sometimes I shoot, sometimes I direct, sometimes I write, sometimes I produce. I, get, I, I do a little bit of everything. And I also work, dabble in a little bit of the mediums that are up here. I've done theater. I've done um, digital projections and digital design work for HTY. Um, I've worked with other organizations here. I've also acted in a lot of things, and you may have seen me on Lost and um, Hawaii's Real Stories. <laughs> um, some people recognize me for doing that. But um, um, I make my full-time living doing this and creating uh, digital media. And, and I think I'm going to go more to digital media than filmmaking, because filmmaking is, is something that's um, a little bit more niche. Uh, digital media is more big and expansive and, to me, more, more interesting for this conversation. Is our Hawaii of the 21st century leaving the arts behind? In this program, we explored what we have in the arts, how vital and precious they are to our future, and what we can do to find creative excellence and public passion for the arts in Hawaii. Will the arts in Hawaii survive? Are they headed for glory and greatness or complacency and demise? One thing is clear. If Hawaii is going to make its mark in the arts, we need everyone to be all in, fully committed, and engaged in the effort to reach world-class excellence and recognition. Thanks so much to our partner in the program, Anthology Marketing Group, and thanks to our program sponsor, Hawaii Business Magazine. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from noon to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons, and then we'd broadcast our earlier shows all night long. If you missed a show or want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on demand on YouTube. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links. Or, better yet, sign on to our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a great new green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, and be part of our live audience. Contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Be a part of our civic engagement on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us, and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together.
On Thursday, January 21st, ThinkTech will join with the Anthology Marketing Group to present a program called Jobs in Hawaii, Working for a Better Future, at the Anthology Theater in Bishop Square. The program will cover the state of jobs and meaningful careers for the youth of our state, whether the job market is adequate for our workforce and sufficient for the economy we'd like to have, and what our governor, legislature, and the private sector can do to provide better jobs and careers to keep our kids here. Join us and raise your awareness about the critical changes affecting and taking place in Hawaii. Be a part of the conversation and sign up to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. And now, here's this week's ThinkTech commentary. Well, one guy, and actually I, he was not from Hawaii, who attended that program, um, wrote me a note afterward. And he said, well, this, this should start up a more robust conversation in the community about the arts. And, you know, the question is a mechanical question. I mean, how, where, what street corner is that going to take place right. on? Um, you know, how do we pursue it? And people always ask that kind of question. Uh, this starts a conversation, and it could, should continue. But do you have any thoughts about how it should continue? If you were going to imagine the continuation of that conversation, well, you know, dealing with the challenges, dealing with the failures, Dealing with the, the, the arts organizations, they weren't in the room, that have fallen off the side, <laughs> uh, where does that conversation happen? It happens perhaps at the Anthology Theater. I'm not really sure where, but how it happens is uh, some higher power, perhaps the senator or someone from his office, someone from an arts council saying, hey, this is what we need to do to bring, to build our arts community in Hawaii. And they say, everyone, they invite everyone all of the smaller places like Kumukahua to the larger ones, um, the Diamond Heads and, and the Academy of the Arts and the schools, and as many people as we can involve in the process and get them all to start to the discussion. And perhaps it it's starts with a small arts festival, bringing awareness to the communities, getting volunteers. I, I definitely believe it, it starts on a smaller level, getting people like you and I and, and my neighbors who then I had a discussion about this with, and then they get re-energized and say, yeah, that's true, I don't even know the last time I, I've been to the museum or I've, I've taken an art class or something like that. So it starts like that, and then more people are, it's in their blood, it's coursing through their system, and they cannot deny it, and they can't turn away from it. They have to be engaged, and they have to try to engage others. And one thing that Gerard Elmore said is that we can't reach our younger people. You know, back when we were kids, our parents uh, did things with us and, and we were involved and we knew about things because we went to them. We went to plays and we went to the museums and stuff. But nowadays we don't do that. If it's not on digital media, the kids don't know about it. But I, I call BS on that one because I really feel like if the parents take the kids, if we take our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors, whatever, to, to different things going on around, then it will be, they will associate those memories with it and then they'll want to do that for their kids instead of saying, oh well, let's just put it all on digital media. Not to deny that because it is a reality, but also we do have to take our children, take our neighbor's children, and, and involve them and bring them to various things going on. We have to stay aware. We have to read the paper and look what's going on or, or look on online and see what's going on and go. That's how we do it. Yeah, it's something that Duke said a little while ago. You know, if, if the generations that come down the pike have no interest or training in the arts, they won't be able to pass that along to exactly. their kids. Exactly. And so they owe it to their kids to know what's going on, study the arts, enjoy the arts, and then pass that on. Exactly. But there's another magic thing. I want to just offer this to you. Please. And that is the kids, they do learn about the arts, and the parents can learn from the kids. That's and the parents point. should be open-minded, encourage the kids to learn, and then learn from them. And then you have something in common 
at that family table you and I talked about, right. the dinner table, yes. right? That's going to rebuild our families yes, and our exactly. state. exactly. <laughs> it starts at the dinner table. It does. Yeah, These yeah. table topic discussions, you know, have throw some, you think of something throughout the week, oh, wow, yeah, the Hawaii Opera Theater. You know, throw it in the jar, and then at dinner time, pick something out of it and talk to your children and and start these conversations and get that energy moving. And yeah, that's how it happens. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Noe, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a volunteer, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech Ohana and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch the show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Duke Oishi. Aloha, everyone. And I'm Noe Ao. Aloha, everyone. Ow, ow.